Hey guys, Thingfisher here, and welcome to build guide number 24. And this is a very simple one. Morgoth's Cursed Sword is one of the coolest looking weapons in the game in my opinion. But the problem with it has always been that for most applications, it's just a weaker version of Bloodhound's Fang. But recently I've seen a couple of videos floating around demonstrating how much better it is after its weapon art buff on 109. And this was the perfect excuse to do a run with it. But we immediately run into a problem. You can't get the sword until you've killed Morgoth halfway through the game. And while there are two weapons that are absolutely perfect for getting through the first part of the game with the correct stat distribution for the Cursed Sword, I've already covered both of these in guides, and I didn't really want to repeat myself. So if you want a nice casual playthrough, you can follow either my Reduvia or Bloodhound's Fang guides until you get to Morgoth aiming for these stats. What we're going to do for this run is be silly and go get Morgoth's Cursed Sword right at the start of the game. So to get set up for this, I followed my standard setup guide, link to the full video and play along in the description. You only need the Sombers here. I also grabbed some different fashion, as you guys know the deal with the bandit armor. So we pick up the action again, here in the putrefied ruins in the Urnia. Head down into the basement for the two finger heirloom. Then head to Fort Gale in Kaled, riding around the back of the building to grab Flame Grantly strength. Now up to the Erdtree Gazing Hill in the Outer's Plateau. Ride past the Wyndham Ruins and around Volcano Manor, then into Fort Lyde and up to the top to grab the Fire Scorpion Charm. So at some point during your setup, Melina will show up to take you back to the round table make sure you go to the round table at some point during the setup otherwise you'll be locked out of it because of what we're about to do then to lena's rise jump on the side of the bridge to bait the knight's cavalry into yeeting himself off if he ever jumps over and gets stuck like this just wait it out he'll fall off eventually then to fort farrath to kill Grail with the Great Knife. And for once, don't use the Bleed Grease here. Grail will take a little longer, but you may find this more useful for what we're going to do next. Now head to Argyll Lake South and equip Radagon Saw Seal and the Strength and Dex Physics into the Everjail to kill the Bloodhound Knight for Old Reliable. Take it to EG and level it to plus six. Then we're gonna head to the minor Erd tree in West Leonia to kill the tree avatar for the ruptured crystal tear. Now to the most southern point of Weeping Peninsula, to the Tower of Return, and up to the top to open the chest to get transported to the capital. We're here to use the ruptured tear skip once again. As usual, I'll leave a link to Ryza's very detailed tutorial in the description. Drink your physic and walk off the ledge as soon as your character raises their arm. Then while you're falling, time an R1 for when you hit the ground. Send the lift back up to unlock the capital and then run through to the West Rampart Grace. Now, since we're in the capital, we actually have access to a somber smithing stone seven. From the West Rampart, make your way back to the Avenue Balcony Grace. From here, 
head down into the subterranean shunning grounds. Across the pipes and down to grab the Somber Seven from in front of this lobster. Now it never occurred to me at the time, but you could actually use this to level Bloodhound's Fang to plus nine to make this bit a little bit easier. If you did that, you could then grab a somber seven, eight and nine from the mountaintops after defeating Morgoth. But everything that you'll see here is with a plus six Bloodhound's Fang. So time for the first bot. So, time for the first boss of this playthrough, Godfrey. As much as our health is a bit of a problem here, we have one of the best weapons in the game, so we won't have to play well for too long. The strat here is to play super safe. Godfrey has a very predictable moveset, so as long as you're not greedy, it shouldn't be too bad. Dodge his combos, and hit him with a single R1. You can get more in than one at certain points, but that's much riskier if you don't know the moveset too well. If you keep the pressure on, you'll get a stagger at about 75% health. This will allow time for a weapon art to finish the fight. Now for the tough bit, Morgoth. The play here is using your weapon arts. You want to try and get two two-parters at the start of the fight. After the second, a single R1 will stagger him out of the dagger attack. Take the riposte here, and then one more weapon art to phase two. Now if you saved the bleed grease from Grail, and used it before this fight, one more hit here, during the transition, will kill him before phase two even starts. I decided not to use it to show you this is possible if you don't have it, or you messed up and used both greases. One more weapon art will end phase two. Head to the round table to get Morgoth's Curse Sword and grab the talisman pouch from the twin maiden husks. Now travel to the alley in the north of the Aeonian Swamp for a somber five. Then to the Bridge of Iniquity in Mount Gelmir for a belting rendition of Snake Eater and a somber six. You can now level Morgoth's Curse Sword up to plus nine. Now we're going to head to the Minor Urtree in Northwest Kaelid for the Flame Shrouding tier, then up to the Merchant in Dragon Barrow for the Beast Repellent Torch. And finally, back to the Subterranean Shunning Grounds, past the Lobsters at the bottom and into the Langdale Catacombs to get catastrophically lost for 20 minutes, then into the Boss Room to fight Esgar. Having the Beast Repellent Torch in the offhand means that the dogs will not aggro to you, making this a relatively trivial fight. And we're set up. Time for Margit. At the Grace, equip the Dex and Flame Tears, the Lord of Blood's Exaltation and the Fire Scorpion Charm. Buff with Flame Grant Me Strength and... Ah, no Margit. Run into Godric's arena to completely bully him with the weapon art. One of the things that's been buffed about this weapon art are the recovery times. After either part of it, you can roll out of it almost immediately, meaning that you can sneak it into openings now that you previously couldn't. And it also allows you to attack straight after using it in a way that wasn't possible before.
then up to Rhea Lucaria to do the same for Red Wolf. For Renala, do all of your buffs before you hit the third sweeting, then spam light attacks on her for an easy one cycle. For phase two, the weapon art's stagger damage combined with the bleed build up makes this completely trivial, even if you run out of FP like I did. Now at this point we need something very important for our build, and to get it we need to kill Radan. Now while a phase 1 kill is not a given here, the fact that we're already a pretty high level with a plus 9 weapon means that he's going down pretty easily. Head back to the round table to buy the red main helm. While the omen killer mask would be the go-to for a Morgoth cosplay, the look I'm going for is pure 80s glam rock. Now to Volcano Manor for Noble. And one of the big advantages for Morgoth's cursed sword over Bloodhound's Fang is its high critical damage. It's a really good weapon if you want to do a lot of parrying and reposting. Combine this with the weapon art for a very easy fight. Head through the rest of the dungeon for Rykard. Once again I'm using the standard speedrun strats to avoid the phase 2 skull shenanigans. Put the lance in your right hand, serpent hunter in your left, and spam crouching pokes for both phases. Now up to the Altus Plateau, for the Draconic Sentinel. Obviously this fight is completely optional, as we've already done laying down. And you might want to skip it, as the Draconics are a little bit of a nightmare with this weapon, mainly due to the fact that they can't be reposted and they have pretty good fire resistance. They take away the upsides of this weapon, leading us with a poor man's Bloodhound Fang. Even at plus nine, this fight wasn't as easy as most weapons are at plus six. Before we head to the mountaintops, speak to our main man at Radan's arena. Then up to Mount Gelmir to speak to him again in the lava. For reasons that I don't fully understand, heading to Mount Gelmir after Radan allows you to skip the Leonia portion of Alexander's questline. I'm not exactly sure what the triggers are for each. Then we're going to head through the mountain tops, up to the big man. Now from the start of this run, I deliberately avoided playing this weapon exactly how I would Bloodhound's Fang, choosing light attacks and weapon arts over the Axe Talisman, Crack Tear and Charges. But for the next two fights, it might prove a little too tempting considering how good that setup is for Fire Giant and Duo. So if you want that optimum setup, Head back to the Minor Erd Tree in the Mistwood for the Crack Tier, and then on to the Mistwood Ruins for the Axe Talisman. For Phase 1, go for Charges or Quick Attacks on the foot. Charges will give you Staggers, Light Attacks will give you more Bleed.
stagger him at the start of phase two and get a weapon art off on the eye. From there, a couple more hits is all it takes. Run through Farum all the way to the Dragon Temple Transept Grace. If you need to, you can nip back to the village of the Albanurix for the first half of the secret medallion and any extra mushrooms or Centrina's lilies you need. Then back to Kale at the Church of Ella for three crack pots and the crafting kit. Run in and put the duo to sleep. This fight could not be simpler for this weapon. Axe Talisman and Crack Tear then two charges and a riposte. After the fight, forget to level up and go jump straight off a ledge with 130k on you. Then head up to the Stone Sword Key Gate and through. Go see our best mate on the rooftops, do a little sparring with him then take the shard he hands you while he tells you he's off to the round table hold to chill with Rodrigo. Now the draconic tree sentinel at Farum. Do yourself a favour and run past him. He's a nightmare with this weapon. It was honestly probably the hardest fight on the run. If you're determined to get him, play it slow and patient. I went for my standard parrying strats. For beast, standard melee approach. Punishing those beast claw attacks with jumps and using that very quick rolling R1 when up close. For Malaketh, Punish that slow 1-2 combo with the weapon art for a very easy fight. And now for a fight that I'd been worried about since the start of the run. I wasn't convinced this weapon would do enough damage to kill Gideon straight away. But Cursed Blood Slice means that even if you do have to fight him, it's easy enough to stun him out of all of his terrible attacks. And it would have been even better if I'd remembered to level up my weapon back in Farron. For Godfrey, you could be forgiven for thinking that this weapon is just plain awful. We're doing 100 points of damage less per hit than Bloodhound's Fang. However, the bleed proc does happen a little faster, and the stagger damage still remains the same. I guess it all depends on how well the weapon art will work for Horolook.
For Radagon, you want to go with Curse Blood Slice when you can, as well as heavy attacks to build up posture damage. Taking an advantage of those big riposts when you get that stagger. I will tend to go for light attacks in the more hectic phase too. Now despite us dealing fire damage, this unfortunately isn't one of those fire weapons that will absolutely destroy Radagon. But after that Sword of Night and Flame fight last week, it was good to have an actual scrap with him. For Elden Beast, the damage and posture build from this weapon art is great. Be super aggressive at the start and you'll get an early stagger, allowing you to take 50% of his health bar straight away. Continue the same aggressive approach for the rest of the fight, and he'll go down pretty easily. Now to Castle Sol for Commander Nile. And as much as I was hoping for it, there's no flashy starting strat like the Sword of Night and Flame. Happily, the weapon art will kill either of the summons easily. For Nile, get him down to about 80% health and wait for that big storm attack. And then... For the rest of the fight, I went with parries and reposts. Head back to the second church of America to bully Eleonora for the purifying tear. Ride through the snowfields all the way to Ordner Town. Ride southwest from there, jumping onto this ledge to cheese the invader. Then heading into Mogwin's Palace for Moog. Swap out the flame shrouding tier for the purifying one, as flame is no good to us here. And while you might think that a fire damage dealing weapon would be rough for Moog, this weapon's bleed build-up is insanely good for him. Pretend it's your first time playing a Souls game and spam R1 for one of the easier Moog fights you've seen in this series. Now back to Ordner Town. As usual, I'm using Ordner Skip to bypass the puzzle. Jump onto this pillar, line up your compass to the right of this notch, and do two jumps with the direction order 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock. For Loretta, you can go with parries and charged attacks for the safe approach. Or throw caution to the wind and bully her with cursed blood slices. Compared to either of the tree sentinel fights, this one actually isn't that bad. Before we head to Melania, head to the Minor Ur tree in Northeast Kaelid to kill the Avatar for the Stone Barb Crack Tear. Now the reason that we're grabbing this is because of a couple of videos I saw by a channel called Sack Slave Gale. In the first of his videos, 
Gale used Morgoth's curse sword to completely stunlock Melania, beating her in under a minute. In his second video, he used the same method to beat her in 28 seconds using the volcanic pot strap. Now, I can't replicate Gale's setup at this level. He's at RL 150 with a whole host of buffs that you can see in his footage. So head over to his channel to check out both of these fights, see all of his setup and show him some love. They're two of the coolest Melania fights I've seen. So the general idea is this, hit her with a full curse blood slice, then a single R1 directly after to get a stagger. Take the riposte, then repeat. Even on a standard endgame build like this, it's enough to get rid of her phase one without any issues. For phase two, I took advantage of this weapon's great riposte damage and went for parries for the majority. However, if you're in a super aggressive mood like I was, curved greatswords are great for bullying her around with light attacks. And finally, Plassey. Using the weapon art between the lightning strikes at the start will get you an early stagger. From there, just get it in when you can with quick attacks to build up bleed and more posture damage. We feel noticeably down on attack power here compared to a lot of other weapons in this series. So are the buffs to this sword on 109 enough to make it a better PvE choice than Bloodhound's Fang? No, not at all. Bloodhound's Fang is an almost perfect weapon on its own, let alone the fact that you can apply grease to it. But for some fights on this run, Cursed Blood Slice makes this weapon so strong that it utterly monsters its bigger brother. And for me, that Melania fight compared with just how cool this weapon looks is more than enough to warrant a Dex Arcane playthrough. And that's it, Morgoth's Curse Sword. If you've enjoyed this video, give it a like, tell me what build you'd like to see next in the comments, and subscribe to my channel for more Elden Ring build guides. As always, thanks for watching. See you soon.